I made a joke in my last video about building my own pyramid, and that got me to remember that there's still a major part of the ancient technology riddle that I've yet to solve. How the heck did those dang Egyptians move those giant stones so efficiently? What the heck is the Ring of Solomon? Did the ancient people really use demons to lift rocks like Solomon claims? Spoiler alert, no. I am a skeptic, remember? I asked the demons and they told me they would never do something like that. <laughs> And I think I'm going to quit. A long time ago, I remember hearing a hint to this riddle when reading accounts to how ancient humans used to describe their encounters with the giants. There were tribes in the Americas who claimed that they always knew that the giants were coming because they could hear the giants whistle. That always stuck out in my mind. What the hell is the giants whistle? And recently that got me thinking, what if the Ring of Solomon isn't a physical ring? What if it is ringing? A whistle? A cymatic resonance frequency that somehow changes the properties of a stone? In the Bible, there's the story of the walls of Jericho. A group of Hebrews marched around the city several times over several days with the Ark of the Covenant blowing trumpets. People have suggested for years that this means that the Hebrews had cymatic technology. But nobody seems to know what is actually happening to the stones. Just that it has something to do with sound. I'm gonna be entirely honest with you here. I've put this question on the back burner for over a decade now because I've been feeling genuine anxiety about it. I feel totally useless, like a complete idiot, constantly failing and swimming upstream when it comes to music or sound related things. But I swear to God, I sat down to think about this weightless rock riddle for five minutes last week and it clicked for me. I'm not even joking. And I know that I bring up Tesla and Newton in every episode, but I gotta remind you that I would not understand even half of this stuff without them. Whatever it was that they saw in the Great Pyramid, I see it too. To me, it's like a big bright beacon that shines hot in my face. And it became an obsession to solve that riddle above all other things in the universe to me. That is the thing to which I sold my soul. And I feel that this video more or less solves the final major intellectual question. How did ancient dudes move big rocks so good? But before we get to that, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Raycon. When listening to the right song, it can feel like my head is on fire. So whether I'm lifting weights to some heavy rock or meditating to some chill lo-fi, I gotta have my Raycon everyday earbuds. Raycons have super modern features. They allow you to switch between three audio profiles by holding the left ear, answer crystal clear calls with their onboard microphone, and even switch from noise isolation mode to awareness mode, allowing you to hear your surroundings while listening to a song or podcast. All of this while being water and sweat resistant and boasting eight hours of continuous playtime. No wonder Raycons have over 50,000 five-star reviews. Recommend a popular artist. Did you guys know that Taylor Swift was the number one selling female pop artist of last year? That means Taylor Swift is the best. That's science. And I think that we can all collectively agree that none of us need to listen to number two or even try to figure out who that is. We're good. Oh, and Katy Perry's great. <laughs> and Raycons are super easy to use. After you've got them paired to your device, all you gotta do is take them out of the charging case, stick them in your ear, and you're listening to your favorite music. I know that money's getting tight with inflation and cost of living increases, and maybe you wanna get into wireless audio, but you don't wanna break the bank testing them all out. Well, Raycon has got you covered. Raycon's mission is to prove that you don't have to pay an arm and a leg for smart tech listening features. A no bull product. Raycon offers like the same high quality audio as other premium headphone brands, but you can buy a pair and even a spare to throw in your gym 
Bag as a backup and still pay less than some of the big tech brands. And if you don't love your Raycons as much as I do, Raycon offers a money back guarantee. And I am here to make that deal even sweeter for you today. All you gotta do is click that link in the description below. Go to buyraycon.com slash skeptic to get 15% off of your Raycon order. And thank you for supporting my channel. Bye Raycon. The archaeological community has had a lot of theories over the years about how ancient people move stones. I like some of them. Some of them are kind of fun. The people of Easter Island said that after the construction of each of those giant statues, the ceremony would be to walk the statue down the mountain to the shore. That's right. Ancient people believed these stones would walk down the mountain. But look, guys, there's no way that this is how they got the stone for Stonehenge all the way from the quarry up north, hundreds of kilometers to the Stonehenge site. That's just, a, that's a joke. Just stop. Please, everyone, stop. Something that the mud flood community brought back to life is the star fort phenomenon. I've mentioned these before, but star forts are usually built in a specific star shape. These star shapes often match cymatic resonance patterns, meaning these are patterns that sound waves literally take in the air in the third dimension, suggesting that there was some sort of cymatic resonance frequency resonating throughout the town in the shape of that star fort, likely from a central building. Now, whether or not the sound waves were actually filling the entire town in that frequency, I don't know, but it suggests at very least they were trying to fill the town with that sound frequency. Pleasant humming sounds can put an entire town in a good mood, and it can even promote good health. Certain frequency patterns even change your metabolism, your brain function, and can even counteract depression. These central buildings that were emitting this sound were likely what we now call churches. Churches often, too, have a cymatic resonance frequency pattern in their windows. Like, guys, they literally tell you right on the side what frequency it plays. I remember in the late 90s, they used to warn us not to watch too much television because it lowered your brain function and even lowered your metabolism. They were warning that this is part of the reason why so many of us were turning out obese. Tuning your brain into a reality created by a piece of art can literally alter your bodily functions. This is something that the conspiracy theory community always brings up with pop music. I did a podcast on Satanism in the music industry, but more importantly is the Josie and the Pussycats machine. That shit is real. Music that's played at 440 hertz makes you sleepy or dopey. Even pop songs that are supposed to be like fun dance songs, I notice if I listen to them too long, I start to feel like I'm going to sleep. Like even K-pop is considered some of the sleepiest music ever. How is that possible? It's because they play it at 440 hertz. It's because they intentionally make it dumb and slow and dopey to put children's brains to sleep. But music that's played closer to the 432 hertz range will actually wake your brain up. It'll be sharp and bright. It'll make you feel awake. It'll make you feel energetic. 432 hertz used to be the global standard for musical pitch until the 1800s, when it suddenly changed to 440 hertz. Right around the War of 1812, if you know what I mean by that, right? 440 is supposed to be for opening the third eye or being spiritually awakened, which is, it's good for meditative stuff. States. But if you're trying to function and actually like break out of the matrix and be a real human being that doesn't follow what the news says, well, 440 hertz music is going to make you one of those useless corn syrup sucking idiots. The 440 hertz frequency essentially makes you brain dead and opens you up to subtle suggestions and makes you easier to manipulate. Pop music, ladies and gentlemen, the music of the devil. Remember what I told you, the entire 
universe is just light matter vibrating at different rates and frequencies. So if we can manipulate rates and frequencies, does that mean that we should be able to create a resonance frequency that manipulates matter? The answer is yes. Yes. Yes, you can. See, just like the way Tesla demonstrated that you can light a light bulb without plugging it into anything, you just need a source of electricity. You too can get something to vibrate without it touching anything. You just need a source of vibration. This Egyptian god is holding a staff that the mud flood community has suggested is likely a tuning fork. And this is a foreman or a supervisor on the job. Website. But the alternative history community thinks that that means that they're using sound to cut the rocks, or shape the rocks, or somehow they're using sound to lift rocks up into the air? Guys, you're expecting far too much out of the term weightless. It doesn't mean they were literally defying gravity. It means that they were weightless to pull. Remember? Ancient laborers pulled. So you are right. This is a tuning fork. This guy is likely some sort of a foreman or a supervisor, and he's using this fork to check for frequency. But this fork itself does not cause the vibration. He's just holding this staff to make sure that the vibration device has reached the correct frequency. I'm not going to pretend that I know the exact process, the exact devices or whatever. I'm just like the geopolymer stones, I'm just going to prove that they understood the basic principles of vibration. So again, I got to give a shout out to Tesla. My man over here built an electric oscillator, and this thing is dead ass exactly like an onk. Tesla himself is the one that turned me on to the idea that the universe is vibrating at different rates and frequencies. By electrically oscillating the air like a musical instrument, one could create a vibrational frequency in the air. Whether you hear it or not, and whether you feel it or not, the air could be rapidly vibrating around you, like a high-pitched hum. If you did this fast enough, at a quick enough rate, it would cause a high-pitched squeal. Perhaps this was the sound that the natives were describing from the giants. Now here's the magic part. If you vibrate the air at a specific frequency, say a C note, and you had a tuning fork or some sort of a piece of hardware that was tuned to a C note, then that hardware would also start to vibrate completely detached from the original C note, simply from sharing the vibration in the air. This one is making this one oscillate due to resonance. So it's a forced motion. It's pushing and pulling the tines, but it's just by, it's like a driven oscillator if you think of it, but with a sound wave. Every other note sharps, flats, whatever, they would all remain inert. Only the C notes would vibrate. Ah, uh, so do you see where I'm going with this? Tesla once theorized that you could use a tiny oscillation device to collapse an entire building or a bridge. All you would need to know is the oscillation frequency. Mythbusters even tested this and with a tiny device managed to get an entire bridge to shake. But what's crazy is you don't even need to attach a physical device. All you need to do is figure out what frequency that building plays, what note that building would play, and then just play the frequency at an extremely high rate and eventually that structure will collapse. Gabriel, blow the trumpets. I love that this was the onk people used to represent the Tesla oscillator because this onk includes three different hieroglyphs that are often depicted together. The tuning fork staff, the jed pillar, and the onk. They almost always include a serpent as well, some sort of a slug or a snake or a squiggly line. So a jed pillar represents power and stability. The Jed pillar with arms is Osiris. 
One of the versions of Osiris is a Jed pillar. The term Jedi is an occult term for a wizard who is a wielder of electricity and sound. The Jed pillar is also described as Osiris's backbone or his spine. The backbone of Osiris was electricity. If I haven't already made that blatantly clear in this series. Check out this hieroglyph. Everyone in the alternative history community says this represents light bulbs being powered by electricity. The snakes in the center represent electrical power or some sort of plasma. Plasma arcing is a serpent of electricity. A lightning bolt is a serpent of electricity. And supporting the light bulbs in this hieroglyph is a jed pillar with arms. That's Osiris. He's creating stability for those light bulbs, like a Tesla tower. The god of power is creating a stable electrical field to allow these electrical objects to operate. Do you get it? The jed pillar is literally a Tesla tower. Tesla was reinventing and rebuilding ancient Egyptian technology. There's no way that he didn't know he was doing this. Here's another example of these three hieroglyphs together, this time with a squiggly line on top instead of a slug. Tell me that this does not represent electricity. Hieroglyphs like this are often depicted between gods on important temples. This hieroglyph is telling you how they built the temple, or perhaps even the function of the temple. Electricity and harmonics. You get it? The foreman supervisor would hold that tuning fork staff, and by feel in his hand, he would not only be able to tell if it was playing the right note, but if it was vibrating strong enough to move the stone. If they need just a little vibration to get down a steep hill, or if they need a lot of vibration to get across rough terrain. So there's only really two options as to what it is that they're vibrating that's allowing them to move the rock. Are they putting the rock on some sort Sort of a vehicle like a plate or I don't know some sort of a land boat that's set to a specific note and then they're vibrating their oscillator to the specific note of that plate or that land boat I feel like that's the most intuitive answer that's the answer you want to hear but believe it or not they were actually vibrating the stones remember these aren't normal stones this is geopolymer these are musical stones. This looks like a, a Stone Age guitar. Now you might think that the stone shape is just accidental and that it broke off or something. You'd be mistaken because I've collected probably about four or five stones that are very, very similar in shape, very similar um, carving structure, this broad base here and then down to a narrow tip and somebody removed this particular piece of the stone over there for specific reasons. I remember it's also covered in patina, the skin of the rock, this brown reddish color that covers the rock that is no longer the original black or charcoal color, the original color of the metamorphosized quartzite that's underneath. I'm holding it and it's deadening some of the effect. There we go. This thing really rings like a bell and it reverberates for quite a long time. It's also important to note that you cannot carve or chip the stone. It will splinter and fragment and it will not be chipped or carved. These shapes that we see here must have been molded in some way. <laughs> it's not an evil genius moment, but God damn, did I earn this one. But here's the thing, here's the thing. Even if I'm entirely wrong about every single thing I said in this video, you know that I'm right that you could do exactly what I just said, right? Am I Tesla 2.0? No. 
Am I Newton 3.0? No matter how advanced or determined these ancient people were though, I refuse to believe that they employed this method to get rocks to travel more than a few miles at a time. There's no way that the Stonehenge people were doing this to get rocks to go hundreds of miles. That's just, it's too much effort to walk a stone that far. I still believe that they're vibrating the stone to get from a quarry to a general highway. And what was the highway of the ancient people? Rivers. We already know that the ancient Egyptians used boats and also wrapped stones in reeds and floated them down the river. Could they have done that with Stonehenge? You're goddamn right they did. Stonehenge is not nearly as big a mystery as you keep playing it out to be, okay? You need to look at the layout of Stonehenge. Most temples are at the top of hills, right? But Stonehenge is like at one of the lower areas in the region. If you do a zoom out, you see it's not really that far from a river, and off of that river runs a channel towards Stonehenge which is currently a dry ditch. This dry ditch used to run off of the main river, right to Stonehenge. And what did I tell you about round buildings next to running water? That's right folks, Stonehenge was a fire temple aligned to the winter and summer solstice. And they built it by floating the rocks wrapped with reeds down the river right to the building site. Like, come on guys, a fucking caveman can figure this shit out. God, I cannot believe I have to share this fucking planet with my mind.